Before I have a couple of audience questions, but before that, I would like to give now the the floor to Dave Lester, who's commenting on on your talk. Um, I'm just going to find the list because Dave, do you have uh, any slides that you would like to present? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Now we can. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the I don't think I actually had a comment for Damien. I think you picked up two of the comments I had for. Uh, Mark earlier on. Um, so uh, perhaps we should uh, get on to the next speaker. That isn't me, is it? No, no, you were you were just you were commentator on on, on this talk. But um, if, if if the point that you you already made it in the last session, then maybe uh, we can take one of the audience questions if you like. Um, so I had a question in the in the chat from Nicholas Rose, who asks, uh, it's, a, it's a question for you, uh, Damien. Um, when when uh, you are tapping into these uh, thoughts uh, of of uh, uh, patients in a vegetative state, I think, or uh, well, let me just read the question so I don't make up things. Uh, the question is: Is the patient imagining the movement, uh, just thinking? Or are they trying to move that muscle, or is it, or is it that not a, is, or is that not a meaningful distinction? So the point is whether the conscious thought alone is what matters, or does the intention behind it also matter? Well, the core thing is we're measuring signals over motor cortex, so they have to activate motor areas, and it's been shown that imagined movement activates similar motor areas as. Uh, executed movement or attempts to execute movement. So in the context of trial and BCA with able body participants, you know, the direction is to, to tell them to do imagined movement um, because you know we don't want them to be performing movement because then it doesn't really represent what, what a patient might experience. But in the context of a patient, they could be attempting to move or they could be uh, imagining the movement. It'll, it'll activate both areas or the areas in a similar fashion. Um, so we, we will, in some cases, if a person cannot move at all, we will say try to do the movement. Uh, but the instruction there is to try to imagine uh, moving your, your feet or moving your hand. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a question. Uh, yes, we have a question here from Nandima. Yeah, um, what I'm wondering, it, it's sort of a follow up question is, just imagine a patient that has got no um, sort of experiences of moving anything, so who has sort of always had been in an emotionless state. Um, does it still work to ask of some such a person to imagine movement of any kind? Does that work? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Typically, all the patients that we've worked with, um, you know, have lost movement. So someone who's born without any movement, then it would be a challenge them for them to even uh, consider movement. If their motor cortex may not be developed whatsoever. Um, so that would that would be a challenge. Uh, in terms of you know length of time since injury, um, you know there is an indication that motor areas, you know, when they're not being activated, they're they you know the they're not, you know, there's a degradation in, in activity in that area, and therefore the signals may become a little weaker, or, or you know, they may not be able to activate them as they haven't been done so for quite a long time. So yeah, there, there's different issues, but based on your question, if somebody has no experience of activating motor imagery or motor areas, then they would not be able to do it in our trials either. But as I say, typically all the patients we work with have, uh, you know, been normal, able-bodied individuals for quite a long period in their life, and then they have their injury, um, and so they have that that experience of, of movement. I don't know, does that, does that answer your okay. question? Yes, thank you very much. I just have a follow-up uh, from Nicholas Rose to the, uh, to his question. He says, my question was linked to the very final point in the talk, whether you could read out from the thought itself without going via the motor cortex. I think this possibility was referenced 
to sh to shock. I'm not sure. Actually, I'm I'm a little bit lost here. But yeah, does it make sense to you, Daniel? I think I know what uh, Nicholas is. is uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose going back to the start of the presentation, there, you know, motor imagery or motor signals are reasonably well defined in the in the cortex. You know, whenever we imagine movement, we know that it's going to activate areas that are involved in movement. In terms of a thought or you know, um, uh, you know, a memory or you know, there's so many different thoughts a person can have. There's so many different memories a person can uh, image or, or, or imagine. Um, it's very hard to, to say, right, there's going to be a clear, distinguishable signal. So at this point, it's, it's, it's not so easy to, to just use thoughts and translate them into, mm -hmm. into a control signal as reliably as motor imagery. But the idea is that one day we may be able to do that by looking at, you know, more invasive techniques and single neuron activity and so on. There has been a number of studies done in this this area um, in terms of reproducing, um, you know, spoken word um, and reproducing um, visual scenes based on a reconstruction of brain signals. Um, and, you know, that's kind of small steps towards maybe uh, direct thought translation, but yeah, the reason we use motor imagery is because it's fairly clearly defined for most individuals. I think that may answer Nicholas's question or give some indication, but uh, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Otherwise, I, I think we will hear from him <laughs> if he wants to follow up. But uh, in the meantime, I have a question from uh, Roger K. Moore. And uh, Roger, you, uh, you can unmute, unmute yourself and, and ask the question if you like. Roger? Now, Roger, I just uh, unmuted you, so you can go ahead and ask your question if you like. Thank you. Sorry, I was uh, struggling to find the right place to uh, click there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Damon. Lovely, lovely talk. Um, uh, my, my question really is about the performance uh, of your best systems right now. You, you talked a lot about classification accuracy. Yeah. But then I, we also saw that the um, the signal is evolving over time. So, um, are you able to characterise performance in terms of information rate rather than just accuracy? Yeah, well, look, the, there's a lot of we look at the bits transferred per per minute or whatever. Um, motor imagery is typically. You know, if we range between 80 and 100% and accuracy after some training, and we were able to, to provide in a trial based format, we won one binary response every uh, six seconds, then typically we could have, with 100% accuracy, uh, 10 bits per minute uh, information transfer rate. So the typical reported for motor imagery BCIs is between 5 and 15 bits per minute. On the other hand, there are BCIs that involve uh, visual stimuli, so the presentation of, of a virtual keyboard on the screen with different flashing stimuli. Um, it's normally whenever you look at a particular letter in the keyboard and that flashes, it will elicit a, a P300 response, which is a positive potential that occurs over occipital areas approximately 300 milliseconds after the, the the stimulus flashes, i.e. the one that you're you're intending to select, the one you're looking at. Whereas all other letters, when they flash, they will not elicit the, the P300 response because you're not looking at them. Now that, that type of BCI where you have a virtual keyboard can, you know, get up to maybe, there's been reports of up to 30, 30 to 40 bits per minute. Um, and reasonably high accuracies. There are reasons that this technology may not be good for some. So, for example, the people we work with who are disorders of consciousness, um, you know, their visual gaze cannot be used to focus on those visual stimuli. Um, people with motor neuron disease may not be able to focus or their gaze on the stimuli. And then, due to flicker, flickering and, and flashing uh, stimuli, 
the prolonged use can can cause uh, irritation. So these guys are still very limited in their, you know, I showed a, a, an image there, the, the information transfer compared to other input methods to the computer, and it's it's still, you know, probably the lowest performing of, of all communication methods uh, shown in that figure. So. Um, yeah, that's that's a challenge is to try and improve the information transfer rate. Now there are techniques. I didn't get to show that or explain that very well there, but we've we've looked at ways of, you know, increasing the information transfer rate by rotating circles um, and allowing the person to select those um, at any time. Sorry, that's not a very good description, but there's there's ways of doing it in the interface to try and improve the information transfer rate. Um, but yeah, that's that's a that's a problem at the minute. Okay, well, thanks very much. It was the numbers I was after. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, um, I have a yeah a question because now you you are uh, conducting these experiments on on humans, and and they give you some idea of uh, what's happening when someone tries to think of a certain movement. Or at least there's a there's a signal formed, and it 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 says something about an activity in in the in the brain of that person. But I was just wondering if it could be used also um, on non-humans, like uh, some home measurements or uh, robot thoughts or computations or something. Maybe I'm I'm far out, or or like some com kind of computer systems, or I don't know. Help me out. Is that possible? Um. Yeah, like, you know, we're looking at neurophysiological uh, signals, so I'm not sure. Um, there are, like, for example, there are studies done with, or there's there's some work going on in the area of emotion recognition um, from from EEG, from non-invasive recorded brain activity, and you know, robots may benefit from that and where a person can express their emotions through uh, EEG and it might be easy for a robot to interpret those emotional conditions um, rather than looking at facial expression or various other things so I, you know that might be something but in terms of applying a BCI on a robot um, I don't look I have so unless, unless they've got more, you know, like uh, biological based mm. control systems, then yeah, it might be might be, be difficult but, to, to apply the same strategies. Yes. But even that, I think that point was is very interesting. If it could be used in some way to improve communication between uh, a robot or a robot system and humans, because I guess that's that's uh, at the moment difficult. Yeah, and there has been some. Uh, virtual partner interaction studies done by a uh, group Scott Kelso in, in in Florida looking at you know how a robot a virtual partner would you know follow finger tapping and and how the, the systems couple and decouple and, and go into phase and out of phase and you know that's that's an interesting uh, you know study in terms of how Robots and humans may interact one day, and how it's comparable to to human to human coupling and, and interaction. If I may, I have, uh, I have one more question that might be a little bit out there, but yeah. Um, when you have you're developing this kind of technologies, do you ever like think so far as um, being scared of? Um, different groups and societies that could sort of hijack your technology. I'm thinking about like, for example, religious groups or, you know, the start of um, people in vegetative states. And if you can prove that there's somehow uh, someone there, then, you know, you could perhaps imagine that such a technology could be hijacked uh, by some groups to either keep people alive or, I don't know, you could imagine new criteria for brain death or something like that social consequences of that? Yeah. Um, like I said, you know, the key thing is to try and develop technology that improves quality of life. And, you know, there, there'll always be 
negative outcomes from technology technology development. Um, so we just have to try and uh, you know be aware that, that these things could happen and try to ensure that we you know we we, we prevent that as much as possible. You know, okay, thank you. Sorry. There been, sorry, there has been indications that you know you could you could hijack the system to to try actually you know make somebody do something they didn't want to or assess somebody's brain activity and uh, you you know like steal their 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 knowledge or steal their their you know use it for commercial gain or something where you you might be you know if somebody's using a B C and they're 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 watching adverts or whatever they could. Um, you could try and use that information to understand what that person likes or whatever. And mm. so there's different things like that, that, that may later, you know, if, if people start wearing neuro headsets all the time, then those types of things uh, might become an issue. But for now, I don't think it's, it's a, it's a major concern. Okay. I, w I was going to ask, uh, I think uh, the rest uh, of the, of the, yeah, the commentators and the speakers of the session, uh, if they have any final point that they would like to make, and you, of course, will come as well, Damien, if you would like to uh, to points. make one point. But as I was just going to do that, so you can prepare, uh, we received one question from uh, Michael Rainsborough. Michael, you can just unmute and, uh, yourself and ask. Uh, hi, Damien. Uh, in the early part of this process, when you're developing the BCI and learning how to train a patient, you're presumably using conscious patients. You didn't start with ones who are in a, you know, a, a vegetative state or a semi-conscious state. Uh, and so I wanted to know what kind of feedback you got from the patients, what kind of conversations you use in the training process. Is it always a clinician that does the training or do you ever have family members help in the training process? Okay, well, when we're, when we're Developing our, our strategies and our techniques and testing our feedback paradigms, we'll we'll work with able body participants. And so we'll you know we'll have them in the lab and they can we can discuss, you know, what types of motor imagery they, they imply they apply and you know we can really question them about what their strategy is in terms of uh, modulating their brain activity. Um, so we might give them some direction initially. So you know, whenever they come into the lab for the first time, we'll ask them to, you know, try to imagine squeezing a brake on a bike or or lifting a weight. But then as they get the feedback on the screen and they start learning, well, if I'm doing this part of the weight lift imagination, then that moves the the character accurately. But whenever I do this bit, it doesn't move the character accurately. So therefore, they start to learn the best way, and sometimes they, they completely change their strategies. And you can ask those able-bodied individuals, um, you know, what what they're doing during, before, and after multiple sessions, and and learn from that. In terms of other, we started working with spinal injured patients, um, basically to prove that we could we could work with people who may may have lost um, their you know, lost control or, or, you know, lost control of both limbs and may, may have, you know, less activated motor areas over a prolonged period. And, you know, at that time we were a bit naive. We thought maybe BCI might be useful for those individuals as well as a communication device. But obviously, you know, people with spinal injury can, can talk and can do nearly all types of communication that we can do. Um, so BCIs, as I said, don't really offer those uh any added value in, in sense of communication and, and control in terms of the the spinal injury people then you know I, I gave a few examples there you know they were really keen to to per participate in the trials and you know they, they talked about you know the engagement the strategies um and you know what what benefits it might have for them? As I say, one of the women we worked with was 35 years in a in a wheelchair, high level spinal injury. She you know she did painting with with her or with her mouth. She drove her wheelchair with her mouth, and you know so she could do loads of things without a BCA, and BCA didn't really add value to to her, her daily life in terms. But she was really interested 
and the fact that she was able to play a game for the first time. Um, so we were we were giving her a game feedback. Um, and then, as I say, the other guy, one of the other guys we worked with, it's six months post injury, and he he was a, a an Xbox player with his children, and you know he thought that the B side could could add value there. So then the experience of going from those patient groups to patient group that can't respond at all, and you don't even know if they're they're um, consciously aware. You know, well initially you, you get that feedback then, and then you know you're you you basically try to engage them, you try to speak to them open up a dialogue with them, assume that they're all there and, you know, you encourage them to do it. And like, uh, like when I'm doing the experiments, I'll, I'll talk to the patient all the time. I'll uh, try to interact with the, the family member, the carers when they're there. Um, and I'll show them the results and, you know, try to make sure that they're, they're motivated to keep participating. Um, often we'll, with the musical feedback palette we have, we'll you know with different genres there, we'll try to say right, what type of music do you like? And you know sometimes we have a little competition between the the family members and the the participant and say you know which which music feedback do you think they'll perform best with? Um, and they you know we've we've jazz and rock and reggae and and all those different feedback strategies, and uh, that normally opens seems to keep the participants attentive, but you know, knowing whether they really want to participate for sure and 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 so on is a challenge. And often, you know, there's one case um, in, in the area here in Northern Ireland where a participant had uh, been involved in a vicious attack and uh, for the first five sessions, the participants seemed to be engaging. You know, we could see a clear difference and then after two sessions of no indication of engagement. We we took that as a as an indication that the participant was, you know, either not engaging or not willing to engage. So we we basically asked the participant to, and in, in, in the final session we did was to ask them to right if you don't want to do the experiments, don't do anything. If you want to do the experiments, uh, you know, perform the instructed imagined movements. And so we ran the run or the the session. And at the end of that, we didn't see a, a significant difference between uh, baseline and and, uh, and response. So therefore, we took that as an indication that the person didn't want to be involved in the experiments any longer, and, and we didn't do any more trials with that participant. Um, and said we we would return at a later date. Uh, unfortunately, that participant uh, passed away this year. So, so that's just a, a kind of range of different uh, examples of. of engagement with patients. I hope that answers your question. Michael, is it answer? Yeah, yeah, that does. That's great. And I, I think it's very interesting when the feedback that you get from patients and how it, it shows up in your presentation in terms of some insights that the patients could give that um, that you can then provide to us to talk about. Like I was particularly interested in the woman who um, didn't need a brain computer interface for the things that you thought she needed, but she was quite excited about it for other reasons. Yeah, you know, there, the the World Health Organization has has created a report on you know uh, making technology accessible to the physically impaired, and um, there's recommendations in there that you know everybody should be afforded access to all types of technologies the way all able-bodied participants are. Now, you know, this is not always possible. Uh, there's a, a movement out there called the one switch movement where you know basically if you can if you can access one switch then you should be able to control as many different technologies as possible and, and the, the interface should be set up in that way that you can you can navigate it. Now albeit be much much slower than a, a standard you know mouse or whatever but um, BCIs fill a, a kind of a, a gap there where some people can't even do the one switch or can't do it reliably or it's it's doesn't um, you know the one switch might be not in your head to knock a button or or using your you know limited residual movement in your elbow to, to knock a button um, but in many cases there's there's an acceptance that some people can't even do that so 
B sides can offer all types of things. You know, another uh, example is that when we work with patients and the disorders of consciousness, a lot of the family members uh, report that they feel that the patient is enjoying it. They're, you know, they're activating brain areas that they may not have activated for years, um, and it becomes like a stimulation. So it's, it's, you know, even though they're trying to learn to do this to maybe establish a communication channel eventually. It's a stimulation that they're, you know, so just to have a stimulation on a daily basis might be a, a, a value of BCA. Thank you very much, uh, Damien, for, for that last uh, insight into your work. Uh, are there anyone who would like to uh, make a final point or ask a final question before we end the session here at four o'clock, five past four? Okay, if not, then I just really would like to thank everyone, particularly the speakers and commentators, 